classrooms need to change. Our learning spaces need to accommodate a growing number of learning needs, and I believe that video games are the way to do it. As an English teacher, so far my videos have focused on how literacy-rich video game narratives can be, and how a variety of mechanics can be, in themselves, teachers of certain skills needed for academic purposes. After my shot at Cyberpunk, I realised two things. One, I should talk about Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and two, that I really needed to get back to a multiplayer in order to re-experience cooperative play, community building, and for this video in particular, an understanding of economies. By now, it should be clear that we can connect games' artificial spaces of meaning to the values and ideologies of the world at large in countless ways. Games are part of culture, whether they reflect or transform notions of economic class, subcultural style, gender identity, or utopian community, games exemplify ideas about the way things are, or even the way we would like them to be. Star Wars The Old Republic is a free-to-play MMORPG developed by Bioware, released in 2011 with just over a million players. My plan was to explore an MMO with a universe that I was already familiar with, which would make it easier to sink into the story, but my priority was to explore a subject that I've never quite been able to grasp. I wanted to know if a game could really teach me how to trade. Before playing The Old Republic, I had a very limited knowledge of trading. I was once asked to teach the economy of the black market as a module for a debate competition, but I'm far from an expert. Fond memories of my years served under the Lich King in the midst of World of Warcraft's tipping point have brought me back to the idea of exploring how MMOs teach their players economic concepts, inflation, deflation, supply and demand, budgeting, and managing priorities. I thought that by simply exploring a game with a working economic system, I would absorb this topic via osmosis. So, here's what the Old Republic taught me. It's important to know what players want in an online world. What is it that fuels the grind? Looking at Bartle's taxonomy, there are many reasons why one would choose to play. To achieve, to socialise, to explore, and to kill. And while not everybody cares about making money in an MMO, I did. There are two major currencies in the Old Republic. Credits, the in-game currency, which can be obtained solo by completing quests, looting corpses, and selling unwanted items, and then there are cartel coins, which require a real-world payment. Cartel coins are used in order to purchase special items, cosmetics, and other coveted extras for players who become, as we all do when time is sunk into something, invested in a game. As for trading, players can either trade items as player-to-player -player transactions, precursing their sale with want to sell in the general chat, or players can visit the Galactic Trade Network, or GTN. So, in order to trade on the GTN, I had to obtain items that other players would want. What I did remember from my days of World of Warcraft were that skills were the key to my financial success, specifically the crafting of high-level in-demand items to sell in bulk at the auction house. With that in mind, I immediately googled for the most profitable skills in the Old Republic. After that, it was a case of looking up the ingredients needed to make the coolest looking, most coveted gear, cosmetics and modifications, and finding a way to obtain or craft them. Beginning your very own intergalactic space adventure waddling out of a spaceship looking like a convent nun, the Old Republic does not have to work hard to create a demand for better looking, higher power gear, especially when you see someone zip past you in a badass black and red hooded robe sitting comfortably on a speeder for the very first time. Uh, hey, hey man, wait, wait, can I get a lift? Please, I'm so sick of walking. Greed was predictable. If one slice of pizza is good, it makes sense that your intuition would tell you that five or ten slices would be even better. But envy wasn't about what was good, it was about what someone else thought was good. It was the devil who whispered in your ear about your neighbour's car, his salary, his clothes, his girlfriend, better than yours, more expensive than yours, more beautiful than yours. I've mentioned in my video on Destiny that allowing players to inspect higher level players and their shiny gear early on in the first major town's social hub gives us a long-term, envy fueled goal to work towards. The Old Republic has a bunch of different ways to spend credits and a handful of varying currency types, but in my experience, higher level, better looking gear and mounts are the most in-demand items for trade. So now we know the why, let's look at the how. Naturally, rarer items would be worth more. 
Since my objective at the start of my journey was to simply make as much money as possible, every time I acquired a rare item, I would ignore its properties as a thing that I could use for myself, research its market value and sell it immediately, and by looking up these items and their current market value I wouldn't risk undercutting the competition too much or selling my items too cheaply. Saying that though, one fun little byproduct of learning about trade through this game was that I unintentionally taught myself a neat little lesson about competition. Green, blue, purple and yellow items mean that they are rare, which means it is either difficult to find out there in the galaxy or that it takes time, skill and resources to craft. The reason someone might buy an item that you've crafted could be because it's an essential ingredient in another item they wish to craft for themselves. There are 14 skills to choose from, meaning that even high level players with cash to burn can be accessed by lower level players with a high enough skill. Free to play players may only select two to specialize in, hence why it's worth googling the skill with the highest yield. For example, Rubat Synth Bonded Attachment, a green item, is an essential component of leveling up the synth weaving skill. One can only acquire the materials to make this green item through another skill, Archaeology. So, I spent my time ramping up my archaeology skills, which, importantly, can be done for free by wandering out into the galaxy scanning glory rocks. Now, one needs four Rubat Synth Blanded Afflictions in order to craft another ingredient needed to level up the synth weaving skill, all this so that one day someone high enough in synth weaving can create their own badass looking armour for themselves or sell it for gajillions. I had to start small. Firstly, I noticed that there were fewer than 10 Rubat Sith Brands and MacGuffins on the GTN, four results of which were at a startlingly low price and the rest priced in the millions. Filters allow players to list the cheapest items first, and just like in search engine optimization, buyers will more often go for the top search results. Despite being worth, say, 9,000 credits per item, sellers were putting 126 rubbing sloth batch abrasives up at a time with no option to buy them individually, making a cool 1,134,000 credits. Apart from those four cheap ones, they were all in huge quantities like this. Free-to-play players would not be able to access them due to Bioware's restrictions on their accounts, cutting out a large chunk of the market. I realised that if I bought out the cheaper ones, it would remove them from the market, leaving the remaining versions as the only options for players wanting this item. Now that this item was both more scarce and more expensive at 18,000 credits per unit, I could resell my newly acquired Rubicon Singh Banjax Decrutamonts in multiples of four at current market value, which was now horrendously inflated thanks to me and my greedy counterparts. Furthermore, my items in stacks of four would be the top results. Players seeking them would not only be much more likely to buy them in this quantity, but they would now have fewer buying options available, at least until some jackass comes along and undercuts the market. A simulation offers experiential education, providing professionals with the opportunity to test drive their knowledge in a safe environment. Here they can learn the direct outcome of their actions, which wouldn't be evident for years in the real world. The ability to travel through time very quickly provides professionals with a formal and intuitive understanding of the potential impact of their decisions, not only on their customers, but also on the long-term portfolio financial outcome. After making my first million or two, seeing the state of the Old Republic's hyperinflated economy and playing without access to the latest expansions, I realised that I was dealing in small-time items and that since this economy existed long before I started playing, those with the most disposable income would be high-level players. To make the real credit, I would need to invest time and resources into my own synth weaving skill in order to match their item requirements. A Sith holocron of strategy is only craftable at a high level of synth weaving, but more importantly, this item is also only one part of a schematic needed to make a dark project, an item that requires crafters and gatherers in the armor mech, cyber tech, artifice and biochem skill trees. Once constructed, these multi-tiered purple items can be used as currency for hard-to-get decorations for your guild's flagship, which equals higher prestige amongst guilds. I guess this holds true the idea that cosmetic, aesthetic commodities in MMOs are what really fuels the grind. Selling a crucial part of a current, relevant thing opens up an ever-active, collaborative side of the market, instead of having to peddle rude boy slick brain dead amazements for chump change. Extra Credits have an excellent video on the problem of hyperinflation in MMOs, a problem which occurs when players make money too easily, accumulating so much wealth that the in-game currency becomes valueless. The video explains techniques that game designers employ in order to manage this problem, an example being 
MMOs make use of a number of sinks in their world's economy, i.e. reasons to force the player into spending money, which is then removed from the game's economy. But these sinks are not enough. Republic, and many MMOs like it, have to restrict their players' freedoms in other ways too. Free-to-play players are restricted in a number of ways, but the one that concerned me and my money-making plot was the two-slot skills rule. I was not permitted three skills, unlike subscribers, who also weren't capped at making only 1 million credits. Subscribers also got 500 cartel coins per month to spend on gear or to access essential mechanics, such as the ability to transport to ship at any point, a huge time saver. It became clear after 60 plus hours of gameplay that I too would eventually submit to the will of the dark side and subscribe. Upon doing so, I was immediately rewarded with access to hypercrates, which, like many MMOs, offer a random selection of those coveted items I mentioned at the beginning in a lottery-style dopamine-injecting unboxing presentation which caused me, I admit, endless tail-wagging joy. Microtransactions like these are the true economy of MMOs. I could very easily do an entire video on the narrative and mechanics of Republic, but I'm doing my level best to keep these videos succinct. However, it would be a shame not to mention one or two things about the gameplay, particularly after my gripes about the RPG elements and cyberpunk. So here's an ultra-quick list of excellent instruction designs. Number 1. The Codex There is an alarming amount of information to absorb in an MMO world like Republic. Fortunately, Bioware includes a codex of everything you need to know, which appears in a three-part splash page to help wash down all the chunks of instruction in a vast, conquered galaxy. Number 2. Hot Bars MMO players have to multitask, near constantly. Not only do hot bars allow quick access to abilities, travel and waypoints for missions, each player may customise its placement and size using the interface editor. Very useful. Number 3. Choices Yes, the morality system in Star Wars is binary, light side, dark side but the characters and companions in the Republic universe are so varied and personable that their approval and judgement of your dialogue choices legitimately ends up shaping your narrative experience, if you let it. Where it gets truly interesting is in the game's cooperative story missions, known as Flashpoints. Not only do you get a sweet opportunity to look like a badass in front of a group of real-life players, your choices are on display as, for each dialogue segment, each player must select their own response to the situation and wait for one randomly selected response to represent the group's actions. Pair and group work needs to be explicitly taught, scaffolded and practiced like all effective learning. The more I played the Old Republic, the more I got to know the player base. My own little self-taught lessons were only going to get me so far, I needed to commune with other players and glean their knowledge if I were to truly understand the system. As systems, games provide contexts for interaction, which can be spaces, objects and behaviours that players explore, manipulate and inhabit. Systems come to us in many forms, from mechanical and mathematical systems to conceptual and cultural ones. Chess, for example, could be thought of as a strategic mathematical system. It could also be thought of as a system of social interaction between two players, or a system that abstractly simulates war. For the first time in a while, I had the pleasure of conversing with a number of players who, after many years of seeing the game evolve and hyperinflate, were genuinely happy to share some of their insights to new players like myself. One such example imparted to me by one of my new Sith buddies was that The Old Republic is an MMO founded on the Knights of the Old Republic RPGs from the early 2000s, which means that any and all lore items relating to Revan, a particularly important character from the first game, would sell for billions. Any and all Revan-related items would be particularly useful to obtain and sell on role-playing or RP servers, which are all over the place. Things get really complicated when you factor in guilds, given that tens of thousands of players across the world can be drawn together for a huge number of reasons – social interaction, economic growth, role-playing, competition and conquest. The economic value of an MMO like Republic is not confined to content and events created by the developers, but the stories generated by communities of the players themselves. I'm going to end the video here, but I have no doubt that I will be returning to an MMO in the near future as I found this topic absolutely fascinating. If you have any comments whatsoever, please leave them below, and thank you very much for watching.